Hey, good morning, guys. So this one is a YouTube only stream, right? I haven't done a YouTube stream for a while. Um, most of my streams have actually been on Trade and View. I just find it easier, obviously, get a lot of questions and so on. Um, and it, it just seems to flow and work, right? I've had a few issues with YouTube overall. So in essence, what I want to do, right, is, is just cover a little bit of logic, right? I've literally gone through a, a, a few pages on the BlackRock site, right? And I want to touch on this in a second. But what I want to do is just kind of highlight some some real logic, right? Now, the issue that I find with majority of especially crypto Twitter, you know, the kind of the retail crowd in general, is that they have a very short-term memory, right? You have to realize that 34, 35K, it's still roughly half of the $69,000 that we've had as an all-time high, right? And yet everything is crazy, colossal, wonderful, amazing. Majority of these people are still holding red bags, right? Majority of influencers, they're not even trading, right? They, they haven't traded. They make their money from the affiliate links. They make their money from the YouTube views, right? These guys are not traders, right? You've got someone like Plan B saying, hey, 135K, worst case scenario next month. We hit $15,000 right this is why these people have come up with you know affiliate links and so on and it's constant right four videos a day and so on and so on. the reality is right bitcoin and for bitcoin to, to to be something bigger than it currently is right it needs support right and it, it needs adoption it needs to kind of find its own feet right some of these scam artists they need to leave Right. At this particular point, you'll get regulation, you'll get a lot more industry widespread adoption. And this is the kind of ideal situation, right? That will actually make Bitcoin grow. Right. You get these influencers saying Bitcoin's going to a million with no real support and evidence backing this up, right? I have people say to me things like, Oh, Bitcoin, you know, could hit ten million dollars, someone like Moon Carl had said, right? And then you think to yourself, well, a ten million dollar. What kind of market cap would Bitcoin require for a ten million pound or ten million dollar Bitcoin, you know, price? What, what does a market cap really truly look like? Right? Where does that money come from? I think the assumption is, especially with BlackRock, BlackRock's going to come in and make all of these retail traders rich, right? So what I've done, I've broken down some of the logic, right? And this particular post, I think this was from yesterday or the day before. I posted this and just talked about, you know, first of all, right, common sense. 35, you know, 34, whatever kind of price, 34, 3 at the moment, right? <coughs> we dancing around the 50% area to where the current all time high was, right? That doesn't scream to me, you know, massive bullish interest, right? We kind of dance in at this level at the moment, right? We've got a couple of other factors, right? Including stochastic up on a monthly time frame, already practically overbought. Right. So what I wanted to do is just go back to some of the, the rationale right behind the calls that I'd called over the years and what it means for the current price. Right. And, and this is why it's kind of important to understand the core concepts as to what we've done, what we've achieved will give us a real clear story and, and define the kind of the path forward. Right. And what I want to do is just back it before I go in to the BlackRock kind of ETF and, and, and their page in terms of the realities of ETF is I just want to explain how you join these dots up. Right? So going back, obviously, you know, May 2020, when I was calling long, right, I'd been a money manager for a while. And the problem that I had was I was unable to, to kind of put out publicly what I was doing privately. Right. So at this particular point, it kind of cleared my obligations, you know, kind of got out of my my kind of contract, if you will. And this allowed me to kind of post this particular post in terms of why I was long Bitcoin, right? what I'd seen kind of from that time, you know, in the kind of venture capital space, what I'd actually saw across the board, what I saw coming across the board. Right. From this particular point, the next call was about the reaccumulation, right? Now, for me personally, this is why I talk about this, you know, quite a lot. This for me 
was probably the most significant post that I'd posted over the last couple of years, right? And the reason that it kind of holds a lot of weight for me and it it, it kind of wraps a lot of the overall sentiment, the, the market conditions and the market transition, right? So what we can actually see from this reaccumulation point, right, is an upside target. And that upside target then allowed me to call the rocket call, which, you know, March the 18th, one of the reasons I'd gone short on this was not only where I'd forecasted from the reaccumulation, but you could actually see with conviction a buyer's climax kind of take, you know, take hold, right? A lot of people saw this as the potential reaccumulation, right? And it was almost the the want, the desire, rather than the reality, right? So for me, at this particular stage, as we neared that kind of 60K level, it was pretty obvious what was about to come, right? You had all the kind of, you know, influencers calling for 100K, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? The story was obvious. The play was obvious. The levels were obvious, right? Call this level down, you know, three to four, right? This is an Elliott Wave type account. Three to four, up for a five. What do we do? Three, four, five, right? At this particular point, the one thing that I could see more or less every day, right? And it was coming more and more apparent every day, right? was the fact that we would be coming more and more institutionalized, right? And this is a good thing for the market, right? This is not as obvious as majority of, of influencers or have you believe, right? This basically means that there's kind of bigger player intent in the market, right? That doesn't always mean price goes up, right? It means that there's interest, right? Which then attracts obviously the regulators, which attracts bigger money. You know, the longs and shorts is that it becomes more of a, a thriving opportunity rather than a buy only call, right? So in this particular post yesterday, what I've covered, right, is step by step, you can come into this post, I'll post this into the description as well um, in, in YouTube. And what you can see, right, is that when you break down the logic step by step, the questions that you need to start asking yourself, right, is as these prices rally on, right, we've gone from, you know, 16, 17, 18K, we went up 25, we spent a bit of time at the 25 kind of region. And then we've kind of darted up another you know, 10K, right? <clears throat> the issue is, it's not the big boys that are sustaining the move up. Right? The big boys are actually doing the selling right now, right? The COT data backs this up, supports this, which ultimately means any little bit of hype, like the BlackRock ETF being approved and then taken off the list and so on, is going to be useful for these bigger players to sell into the retail crowd. Well, kind of obvious, right? Now, as we obviously started to move, right, and, and, and I'm going to go back, you know, back and forth, back and forth in terms of coming up to, you know, where we are present day, right? As we move from that 28K, right, the next thing that I saw, which was pretty obvious, was this particular move, right? Now, I talked about this is 24th of August, a year on from that kind of uh, move down, right? We'd moved on down, we'd had the time kind of down low, we'd collected the liquidity at 28. As we then rallied on up, right, the next thing that became very apparent was the reaccumulation again in the four to five move, right? And I talked about this, you know, again, kind of in advance, right, why we would go from the levels that we were at here down, right? This was the three to four, right? This is the nested three to four inside that four to five move. And why we would only see just above the old all-time high before crashing again, right? Explain this in detail, right? So what we then had was the move one, two, three, down four, up five, right? Which puts us in a much bigger position, right? For a much, much bigger move because that one to five move where I've got complacency marked would ultimately mean, right, in theory, we are currently at a one larger scale, right? That one then means that we drop down two, right? So the, the, the drop was inevitable, right? You have people like Plan B at this point saying 98K next month, you know, 135K December. And the reality was we dropped to 15K, right? I think it's time to change your profession when you're that far out, right? In the grand scheme of things, as we started to decline, the next thing that was pretty obvious, right? I've even taken a piss out of Plan B in this particular video, right? In, in this particular post. 
as we started to decline, right, the next thing that was obvious was the redistribution was on the cards. Again, I talked about this early on. This was in January, right? Why we'd actually get the trend line break, how this move would play itself out, and where we'd end up going on the back of this, right? So what you then have to remember is we've gone up, like I said, one, two, three, four, five, right? Five being complacency or a larger scale one. We've now come down, right? Now this coming down type move, we could argue an A followed by a B followed by a C, right? Which means, you know, the bear market's over, off to the moon we go. Yeah, that, that's predominantly what's going around Twitter, you know, all the YouTube videos that I'm seeing right now, all the influencers, speculation is bear market's gone, bull market's in, and off to the moon we go, right? However, a couple of other issues, right? We're down relatively low, right? We're still under that 50% marker of the 69K, right? We have no real bullish intent actually happening right now, almost the inverse, right? We've gone up with depleting volume, right? We've got trend angles that we can measure. We've got obviously stochastic overbought. We got, like I said, depleting volume, weekly, monthly, daily, right? All of the signs point to the same thing, right? Even down to the angles. Right? I've been generous and given us a 28 degree angle, right? Compared to a 48 degree angle for the rally, right? For the proper rally, okay? Now the issue is, if this is what we see as current level bullish, right? Crypto's in trouble. Bitcoin's in trouble, right? So the reason that I say things like nothing's changed, we're not ready, we're not there just yet, right? Brings me into what I'm seeing right now with this BlackRock ETF, right? So in terms of the BlackRock side, <coughs> there's a couple of things that I've I've read. There's a couple of things that I've seen. There's a couple of things that people have said to me that other influencers have gone and, and, and called or said or I've shown, right? Let me just kind of clear a few things up. So first things first, right? This is BlackRock's own website. I was trying to find another page that I've talked about in a couple of streams. I can't find the page again, right? But it, it basically talks about the whole, you know, what an ETF is, you know, how it works, how many ETFs there are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's 13 to 1400 different types of ETFs across the whole ETF market, right? Now, obviously at this particular point, right? This is where I think a lot of confusion comes in. Right? People put, you know, assets under management in terms of BlackRock. They put their, their company market cap. They put, you know, all these kind of, you know, bizarre, bizarre figures that actually have very little relevance or, or impact in terms of what an ETF represents, how it works, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? I don't even know how many funds BlackRock actually managed, right? It's probably that's in its thousands in its own right, okay? So a couple of key points in this particular article, right? And I'll share this as well in the description below, right? So there's obviously a couple of factors that in terms of what influencers are led to believe, right? And in terms of what influencers are trying to kind of pitch, you know, general retail consensus on, right? is BlackRock are going to come in and throw $15 trillion at this Bitcoin ETF, right? And this is where, you know, if you put $15 trillion market cap into to Bitcoin, you'll actually see that exponential growth, you know, over a million dollars, right? So this is where they're completely confused, right? Because if you come down and you read even BlackRock's own literature, right? They're talking about back three years ago, there were $5.8 trillion worth of ETF assets worldwide, right? Just think of that a second, right? So where do you put $15 trillion? Where do you get $15 trillion from? If all of the ETF assets right now, I'm talking 13, 1400 ETFs globally, right? Are only combined to 5.8 trillion globally, 1,400 assets. Where does $15 trillion come into a Bitcoin fund, one asset, come from? Right? Where does that money come from, right? That isn't BlackRock likely to, to want to make retail traders rich, right? That isn't how an ETF works, right? 
So that's the first thing. Then from there, right? Let's look at this in terms of the market volatility, right? And this is BlackRock's own site, guys, right? So this isn't me saying, oh, I think this and I think that, right? This is, you know, this is something that these guys have paid millions of dollars for in terms of having this literature put up on their own site, right? This is the research. This is, you know, this is them kind of signing off on this, right? So <coughs> if we can now realize that there's only 5.8, which sounds an awful lot, $5.8 trillion across 1,400 assets, right? That kind of gives you an idea of what level of impact an ETF could have on the Bitcoin price, right? Now, in terms of market volatility, you know, the, the straight answer, right, is, is no, right? These ETFs are more likely to act as shock absorbers, right? This is one of the best sentences we could look at, right? This isn't, hey, money comes in and price starts to move, right? This is just the fact that bigger players can use an ETF, right? in terms of how they trade the shares of an ETF based on a Bitcoin price, <laughs> right? So, in essence, what you now have to understand, right, is $15 trillion is not coming in directly to one Bitcoin BlackRock ETF. The volatility isn't often affected as an ETF. Right, this, the ETF isn't going to affect the volatility of the Bitcoin market. Right, you can come through this yourself. I'm not going to go, you know, much more into detail in this. Right, this, you know, this is only one aspect. And it, there's there's plenty of pages. You just come into BlackRock. You can just literally type up in the search bar. Right, there's plenty of things that you can come and see, come and find. Right, and th this is without looking at. You can use things like Investopedia and just do your own research in terms of you know how a, an ETF is, is structured you know, what kind of scheme, what incentive scheme for investors, you know, why an investor would buy an ETF or buy an ETF share rather than buying Bitcoin direct and so on, so on. And you'll answer a lot of your own questions, you know, if you know what it is you're looking for, right? So back now to a couple of other key points, right? I've talked about, obviously, over the years, I've talked about these various positions, right? And this comes, you know, kind of hand in hand in terms of the black pot, you know, black rock kind of situation, right? Back in, you know, 2011, when I started buying Bitcoin, all the way through to this kind of 2017 kind of rally, right? This was kind of more of a hobby thing, right? This was something that personally I'd been asked about, um, a project. The project was to do with the Canadian Mint, a project called Mintchip. This was back in 2012. And being in the kind of venture capital space, the investment space in and around payments, banking, you know, high-end security technology for banking and payment type technologies, this was kind of the niche that I'd focused in, right? So being a long-term trader, and then kind of switching back and forth between kind of trader slash investor, investor slash trader, you had a very unique view of the current market kind of situation, right? Now, this is what, you know, really kind of drove it for me in terms of why these moves played out the way they played out, right? So I really ignore anything as a trader prior to this kind of 2017, kind of this was December 2017, kind of early you know, January 2018, I kind of ignore anything in terms of, you know, numbers, volume, you know, profiles, anything along that, right? For me, it wasn't until kind of that January 18 onwards that you actually saw the kind of larger, you know, institutional involvement, right? Now, early on, this was predominantly angels, venture capitalists, right? I'd go to family office meetings, I'd go to these LP type, you know, events. And you kind of had sentiment from the larger players, the larger operators, that if Bitcoin was up on the week, right, the investments would flow into blockchain slash crypto type technology, right? And this was before, you know, cryptocurrencies, before, you know, before they got hot, right? This was kind of predominantly blockchain technologies, right? This was kind of Bitcoin's a thing, but there's nothing really, nothing really else kind of there just yet, right? This was kind of the start of the shitcoin era, 
right? So at this particular point, there was a lot of interest from VCs, not so much in the individual projects, but as a, as a collective, right? Bitcoin being the indicated. Bitcoin went up, investments flew. If Bitcoin went down, they were a little bit more reserved in making investments in blockchain type companies, right? And it was kind of as simple as that, right? As ultimately Bitcoin started to, to grow and some of the intent started to come in, this was the early kind of institutional play, right? This was the kind of the first signal that there was different types of money coming, right? So when I talk about institutional money, you can break institutional down to, you know, funds and funds of funds. You can break it down into things like venture capital funds, private equity, hedge funds. Uh, you know, you, you've got things like, um, you know, even down to mortgages. You've got pension funds. You've got a completely different array of of professionals operating in these spaces right now this is where again the crossover between you know black rocks etf and the, the, the bigger picture kind of comes in right some of these fund managers and some of these fund structures are unable to directly invest in things like bitcoin right they need they need the regulation they need um, certain criteria around the investment kind of form right however other forms of investment vehicles are a little bit more liquid in terms of how they can operate, what they operate in and around, right? So it wasn't until this point that we kind of started to see a, a kind of a, a tug of war in terms of smaller scale angels and, and VC type kind of investments. These guys kind of found ways to, to, to get involved, right? Whereas the bigger players clearly couldn't. Right, or couldn't operate in the same the same speed right now as we then rallied you know we had this reaccumulation i've talked about this right this was for me the you know the first real telltale sign that these big boys were here and they were here to stay right then ultimately we rallied on that right we had obviously you know the distribution the distribution was called in advance dropped down exactly to the level right all of these things were massive, massive telltale signs that the bigger players are year to play, right? Now, that's the one thing for me that I've taken away from kind of all of this, right? So, putting all of these pieces together, right? This isn't just a, hey, look, you know, I was right over here. I've called the bottom, you know, I've called the reaccumulation. I've called the distribution. You know, I've called that accumulation. I've called the redistribution. You know, I've called the top again. You know, guys, this isn't just a, you know, look at what's been done, right? This is more about the fact that it's been done, right? Is a very, very good telltale sign as to what hasn't been done here, right? And this isn't me being bearish. This isn't kind of all negative doom and gloom, right? This is, I've called a larger scale accumulation, right? I've even had this published in my book, right? This larger scale accumulation, it's still very early on, right? Now, the reason that I feel that it's early on, the reason that I feel that it is an accumulation, right, is we've got COT data, right? We've got the big boys, the asset managers, right? These guys are clearly long, right? This is the long-term view. This is the long-term vision. However, short-term vision, leverage funds are not quite ready, right? Which brings me back to nothing's changed. The reason I'm saying nothing's changed, right, is that if we were to assume that this is our larger scale one, based on the back of the three, the four, and the five move, right, on the nested side, <coughs> we could argue A, B, followed by C, right? I just don't like this move. I don't like this move being completed, right? So for me, I personally prefer this as A. I really like this move, right? Something like this as a B. Right? Now, C doesn't have to be deep, right? C could be an ABC type move back down to comparable levels before we really start to get some momentum, right? I like this bottom in pattern. I like this type of move. I like the stochastic in terms of where it's at, right? And I like the fact that if we do something like this, we've got probably a better runway to clear 100k right if you don't agree with this right now right 
and the assumption is we bullish and we're off to the moon. Let me show you exactly where I think the moon is likely to be. The issue that we have right, is twofold. When you create an Elliott wave type of bias, right, you need to have, let me change this to primary numbers, uh, change that to white, there we go. You need to have, right, a couple of things happen. First of all, we're going to come from the bottom, right? If we're going to see a one, a two, right? We're going to see a three, a four, potential five, right? We could argue that this is the zero, one, this is the two, right? But we've broken down first, so this is the two, right? Which is probably more likely, right? So if we come here and we go there, and then we go three, something like this. Then we go four, right? Then we have to clear five, right? That is what you're classing as a bullish move one, right? There's no other way to count this in this particular instance, right? It's ugly, it's horrid. If you were saying this is bullish and we've got this small degree one, this would put us at a two, right? We've got a small degree two. What you then have to look at is from an Elliott perspective, we have to go zero one down two, right? Which means at this particular point, we can start to use our fibs for the extension levels. Now, let me get rid of this, all right? Which means at this particular point, we can go and see something that will give us a one six one eight oh, one, one. one six one eight right followed by a two six one eight to complete the five right which means we'd be looking at a three up at around 50k we'd come back 40k for a four right and we very likely to see a five and i've said this for the last 18 months or more right if this is where we go right now, this is where we're capped, right? Now, the issue that I have with capping a move like this is that if this is a one and this is classed as our two right now, this would be our three, right? We'd have to come down and do exactly like I've just done one, two, three, right? We'd come back down probably 60%, right? 50, 60%, right? So if I just come back and I put this move on, <clears throat> in terms of what I see right now. We'd have to come back 50-60%. Oh, I've done it again, the wrong one. Wrong one, wrong place. Fib retracement. We'd have to come from here, 67k-ish, right? We'd be coming back down to 40k after seeing 66. Right? For us to only hyperextend for a five to probably shy of 100k which means seeing 100K would put us probably 2027 20, onwards, right? That's not what the bulls want to hear. But this is the reality of the current move. This is the reality of the current situation, right? If we're seeing something like this right now, it is pig ugly, right? And this is part of the reason that I want to see liquidity being grabbed lower than this particular move. And if in an ideal world, this was our A, the one being or this one being the B, followed by a drop down C, then I would love to see a zero to one giving us impulsive move past the 40K. 40K coming back to 25K, giving us the one two move. And then that one two move would give us an extension past the 100K that everybody seems to desire, right? So putting all the logic together, this is what I've tried to, to stress. This is what I've tried to highlight, right? This is part of the reason why for me, nothing's changed. Right. In the grand scheme of things, I'm still seeing this as an A B move. Bigger picture. Right. I'm frightened of this being a zero one. Because if this is a zero one, we have to come back down two anyway. If we come back down two and this was the two, then you know Bitcoin's pretty much doomed. Right. And we're not going to see a hundred K for the next three to four years. Right. Simple as. Now Going back to finish with, right, and this is the final, final bit for me. This is the kind of the piece of the puzzle. The one major, major play, right, that I see 
in this particular scenario, this particular kind of play out, is that when we look at what we've actually got, going back a couple of years ago, I think it was 20, might have been 2019, uh, not 2021, this was October the 19th, 2021. The first US Bitcoin linked ETF, right? This was launched. Look at what we've done since, right? So again, this doesn't fill me with confidence that even BlackRock getting their approval would mean the prices skyrocket. Right? Almost the inverse. It's the shock buffer, right? This is the term. This is the the words that BlackRock themselves have actually gone and used in this. It's a shock absorber, right? And therefore, you have to look at the fair price that larger professional money makers are willing to pay compared to the premium that retail are currently being suckered into paying. Right? Hence, this is my kind of closing argument, if you will, in terms of where we are. We've got stochastic monthly overbought. We've got depleting volume on a, a nothingness move up. Right? We've rallied a couple of K more than I personally thought we would have in terms of grabbing liquidity. Very much likely unsustainable. It was actually hopium on the fact that the ETF was approved without any form of understanding. Right at the start of the video, I've covered everything in terms of an ETF and the understanding of an ETF, why BlackRock sees this, how much money, you know, are floating around ETFs across the globe, not just this one ETF. So when you put all this together, right, my question comes back to anybody that wants to be, you know, negative and anybody wants to go in and say, oh, it's bullish only, it's bullish only, right? is well what happened to 135k plan b right stock the flow model it doesn't work right the reality is what is going to give us the market cap right and this is a genuine question right? if you want to come back and be negative in terms of you know what you hear with this kind of logic right i want supporting evidence to the upside as to what brings this words like the halving right that doesn't mean anything right words like black rocks bring in 15 trillion dollars means absolutely jack shit, right? What we need to understand is what gives the bullish narrative. When that can be answered with logic supporting that answer, right? Then maybe it's justifiable that the time is now. Until then, nothing's changed, all right? So anyway, hope you've enjoyed watching this one. Thanks for tuning in, guys, and I will see you on the next stream. Cheers.